the way for this morning and uh, just as I'm talking the DAX future I can see a centre left just touching on a fresh low so uh, having gone through the first half an hour of cash equity trade the futures just coming under some added pressure through pivot down to initially test this uh, S1 this morning uh, looking elsewhere crude still on the, the front foot uh, adding to the very solid upward trend really without much of one direct catalyst yesterday uh, a few people were talking about the kind of seasonal expected drawdowns that are that are set to be coming in uh, in the period ahead that certainly was evident in some of the data that we had last night with the api crude oil inventories as the kind of front runner to the uh, department of energy's release we'll get later this afternoon so crude once again up albeit just moder moderately this morning 36 cents 51.39 uh, gold has risen in the last kind of hour or so uh, nothing too outright aggressive uh, and overall we're pretty flat on the session I'd say oh, this is a, a relatively tight range a uh, bit of a dip overnight uh, you can see that around 2 a.m. Uh, but that kind of defines the range that we've been in really since yesterday's session uh, as we are around this pivot at 59 so 55 to kind of 60 uh, the more recent range that we've had uh, currency wise the dollar is a touch softer uh, which means that both pairs have seen some slight upward movement as Europe has come into market uh, in euro dollar we've had a, a quick test up at around R1 as initial resistance that was also um, the initial electronic trade open or reopening even yesterday um, which is around those levels as well so nothing really great standout in these market moves this morning uh, and sentiment I'd say is relatively neutral even though the DAX has moved lower I wouldn't say it's particularly negative um, in terms of Asia overnight there was a, some negativity though uh, in terms of the actual index performances across the region uh, a lot of that was emanating from the fact that as you can see what I'm sharing now North Korea um, firing a ballistic missile uh, this might sound quite punchy but in actuality it's it's relatively unfortunately it's a, a relatively regular occurrence so it's um, in context the North Korea conducted another ballistic missile test drawing uh, condemnation from countries in the region shortly before and this is the important point Korea obviously know that the US are having high level officials meeting with the uh, the US meeting with China that starts tomorrow and goes on through Friday and so North Korea sending likelihood a bit of a signal ahead of those key uh, meetings that will be taking place in terms of the actual if I was to get you a map of the actual regional breakdown there's basically in that channel of the sea there's this hypothetical border that would be Japanese territory um, the missile actually fell short of that the, the projectile was fired into the East Sea uh, flew about 60 kilometers so 37 miles uh, but fell short of Japan's exclusive economic zone uh, if it went in the economic in the uh, the actual Japanese territory that would be the more escalated kind of situation would probably be met with some kind of uh, increase in military alert status I would imagine uh, normally though they target it on purpose as a, a kind of a missile launch just to show a, a kind of a threat more than anything what that generally leads to then is more unrest on the North Korean peninsula in that region so particularly Japan and China that East China Sea is hotly contested waters uh, and it just kind of adds to it a kind of a negative sentiment overall so uh, despite a slight positive close major indices in the US uh, slightly negative in Asia maybe that's just contributed to a slight bit of this downtick that we've had uh, in the DAX this morning looking at the charts though you there's not really a great deal here to tell me about the result of the second of three televised <laughs> French debates um, that are going to be ongoing up until the first round of the French election at the end of April 
So last night, obviously the second time that we've seen this event, it lasted for a mammoth four hours. I don't know how anyone can sit there listening to politicians for four hours, um, but there you go. But the key point here and the headline that's being run is Le Pen ambushed in French debate as Macron attacks her Euro plan. Uh, it, it was kind of a bit of a gang up on Le Pen, it seemed to be, and she was very much quizzed about her idea about calling a referendum, exiting the EU, because on balance, when surveyed by various different third parties, French people, although they definitely want European reform, actually the French are very strong in their view that they do want to remain in Europe. So when pushed on the issue, um, her response was, let's say, l uh, less than impressive. Uh, you could obviously see that she was getting a bit ganged up on uh, at the time, uh, under pressure, and essentially she didn't come out particularly well, or let's just say she didn't really add or capture, I would say, any new voters with the performance that she delivered last night. The one person that did was that chap we were talking about yesterday, uh, Mélenchon, who again has taken another kind of uh, concerted push to capture uh, popularity. So he actually came out in terms of an initial exit uh, elab poll 25% actually said that he fared the best or was the most convincing 21% for Macron Filon 15 Le Pen 11 so Le Pen actually came <coughs> fourth in terms of how people uh, on initial interpretation how they thought that it came out um, Macron then 21% wasn't the top performer but certainly hasn't dented his current kind of view, I guess, in public perception and market expectation. And that what you'll probably see in the opinion way polls to come uh, later on this morning and the days thereafter is that this kind of 60 40, 63 37 type gap between Macron and Le Pen, I would say, will probably remain a constant theme. From a trading point of view, I would say still when it's we've seen fluctuations of about three percentage points back and forth between the two in the second round runoff in the polls that's very much priced in really that type of swing I would say you need to see Macron pulling away up to 67 68 70 if the if the gap widens that much or on the reverse if we start falling and Le Pen starts gaining some ground and it becomes something more like Macron falls to 55 to low 50s and we get to a little bit more of a situation where it's near 50-50 then obviously that will have um, very negative read across in terms of how the assets will likely perform uh, but at this point the likely reason why the market's not really seen too much reaction to this Macron situation is really it was kind of the status quo the only person that really was in outperformed let's say was the lower ranked candidates the difference with this televised debate is it included I think all 11 candidates instead of the top five which was in the first round and actually it was the lower candidates that did better so the lower less supported less well-known ones actually came out uh, but with a much more positive view but if you think about it if you're Le Pen, Macron, Filon and so on, you've got it all to lose, so to speak. So you're probably quite guarded, quite measured in your response. If you really had nothing to lose and you were in a, uh, a debate situation, then of course you're going to you know, just go for it. Uh, and actually that's paid off for some of those other candidates. But net net, it's not going to make any difference to them. They're certainly not going to qualify past that first round. So... In terms of the runs that really count, Macron and Le Pen, I would say it's still kind of the status quo uh, at the moment with Macron, the, the clear favourite in that kind of runoff. Quick look at some other stories um, from this morning then, just to run you through some of the main key headlines. Uh, Theresa May in the FT, the UK PM suggesting the country will not finalise EU trade talks before Brexit. So the PM close to admitting uh, ratification of a pact will take longer than two years. To me, this is absolutely as expected, and I think that this is a, an area of which 
when it does happen you shouldn't really be too surprised because uh, the actual kind of details surrounding a finite plan of exiting Europe there's no way that can happen by this two-year clause trigger of Article 50. Hence the reason why Theresa May is suggesting that Britain will now not finalise a new trade deal with the EU until after Brexit is complete in 2019. So again, this is all about leading us into these talks about a transitional period of, at the moment, an unknown or unspecified period of time for them to concrete get a full detailed Brexit plan done. You know, Brexit is not going to finish in 2019. I would suggest it's more likely going to finish in 2023 or beyond. In all honesty, I'd say five years would be a pretty quick turnaround uh, given our integral ties uh, on many different areas that we have with Europe. So not having much of an impact on the pound, but I guess just keeping you informed of the timeline of how these talks are progressing, I would say that you're probably going to hear this type of headline more and more going forward as she looks to push that front. One of the other things um, that I've seen this morning, and I think it's just something to be aware of going through now we're in the midweek, so the second half of this week, I'd be looking out for ECB officials. It starts to pick up a bit of pace. So essentially, Mario Draghi um, is speaking at 9 a.m. on Thursday, so not today, but also tomorrow you'll get uh, Peter Pratt, or Pratt, Victor Constancio. Uh, you've also got the Irish and the French central bankers as well from the ECB. So that's, what, five ECB members, including the president, all speaking on Thursday. And it basically kicks off a period of about nine speakers that you'll get over a period of two days. So obviously people are looking at the ECB very closely about what is it exactly their view about A, the inflation situation, does that then B, lead to them wanting to lift interest rates irrespective of QE ongoing. So listening up for ECB signals, as this headline would suggest, is very important about this key issue of how interest rates in Europe and QE interact i.e. can the ECB follow a policy path that is very different from the Fed which concluded quantitative easing, had a period of kind of, uh, well, of tapering and then of nothing before then going into a rate hiking cycle of which they are now commencing. With Europe is it going to be a slightly different strategy and that's what we're looking out for from these guys. One of the most interesting things here is that the ECB, through that source comment last week, have got a little bit more dovish than what they were sounding. And actually, inflation in Europe in those last March readings tailed off slightly, which lessens the need to talk hawkishly. So again, we'll be interested to see how, how that uh, pans out in the next couple of days. Okay, quick look in the energy markets. Of course, on a Tuesday evening, evening you get your regular API crude oil infantry release so just after 9.30. Uh, let's just have a look at the charts first then we'll look at the numbers. Uh, so if I just find 9.30 so let me highlight it for you. That was the release of the APIs last night. So you know even without knowing the numbers I look at that mess if you like on that 30 minute candlestick you can see we pretty much open and closed at around the same price point however we had extremities on the high side and the low side so a price swing of 51.30 to 51.03 so that volatility probably on the initial interpretation of the news that then would spell to me that it was a mixed report which we had last night but given the way then it moved overnight in Asia and then into the European morning, it was probably mixed but with a, a bullish bias, but nothing outright kind of stellar, so to speak. So the numbers themselves, the headline was a draw of 1.8 million. And I know in comparative to the, the builds of almost double digit millions we were getting a couple of weeks ago, actually a drawdown of 1.8 million is in fact the biggest drawdown of 2017 doesn't sound a lot but it actually is statistically and it was actually much bigger than the expected drawdown of 150,000. The only problem with this entire data set is the Cushing number. So the Cushing number was a build of 1.3 million. So that 
was obviously it's quite a big number for that particular component gasoline though bullish a larger drawdown and expected a draw of 2.6 million distillates a draw of 2 million so you can see here that this is an overall bullish report with the exception being Cushing which might have capped that initial price movement but on balance you can see how this is mildly bullish hence these the kind of leaning towards this price action gradually edging higher uh, looking on the trend as well from yesterday obviously uh, uh, amid not a great deal of uh, news flow we did have a pretty decent move to the upside so that in combination as well will make the release of the numbers this afternoon quite interesting and by that I mean that if we look a bit more longer dated here you know we broke those highs from the end of last week yesterday you can see when that really propelled the price action when it broke those levels that was the the Monday high the Friday high that contributed to probably some of the momentum on the move higher but if you look at where we've repriced to now obviously if the data later is not bullish there's a decent amount of room to move back lower to pair some of that move uh, on a bearish report or just not as bullish as what we may have had from last night so definitely something to look out for later okay quick look at the calendar we've already had um, a couple of the service PMI numbers uh, granted these are as you can see here the European ones are the March final numbers but the UK one uh, is one that I like and it's one I like because of volatility and we like volatility so UK services PMI at 930 if you're trading the pound definitely you need to be on the watch out for that one let's just have a quick look at <clears throat> excuse me let's have a quick look at how that number came out previously uh, and obviously the importance of this is that it pretty much makes up three quarters of the GDP or calculation for the output in terms of economic growth in the UK so in regards to this data it's ex last time it came out at 53.3 uh, 53.3 here looks fairly consistent with what we've had but there's two things here to point out one is last month's reading of 53.3 was below the expected 54.1 it was in fact the weakest since September of 2016 and it was a third consecutive well kind of second consecutive if you like decrease from that initial high point um, that was seen in December of 2016 now people are watching this type of data and all UK economic data very closely for the impacts of which higher inflation is having on household incomes is having on consumer confidence then and so on and so forth price pressures are really starting to kind of uh, put the pressure on the UK economy what we've had is a slow but very distinct deterioration in the service sector in the UK over the course or since really beginning of 2017 then again in February the question mark is does this now come down to kind of the 52 region to show a continuation of this trend the expectation for today is 53.5 which is basically unchanged uh, so that number will be important and looking at cable this morning you know when you have an important data release the market is really disinterested in trading that particular product until it has clarity over these important data releases kind of looking at the price range that we've traded in uh, this would be going back to yesterday encapsulating yesterday's session definitely that range could be broken either side if this data uh, was outline or out of line enough uh, the downside certainly is at risk uh, in this scenario of a weak number which is probably the leaning bias in terms of economic data at the moment uh, and the importance of this service sector definitely we could punch through those lows from yesterday that would then probably open up and move down to uh, s1 possibly beyond depending on the actual outcome of the numbers so look out for that that will be important that's coming out at 9 30. back to the calendar a quick look at the us afternoon it's also quite interesting for the reasons that you get the bellwether kind of reading if you like to set the tone for non-farm payrolls which we'll get on friday that's the adp employment change so this is, this is the private payroll number uh, just looking at this number last month 
for those that did trade um, and were looking at this on the on the program 298,000 ADP came out at that was over 100,000 higher than expected don't ask me how the most brightest minds at all of the most you know bellwether investment banks on the planet can be so wrong you know, but I would say all you need to be aware of is that from a statistical error point of view let's say from a median consensus and an actual figure a beat of 108,000 over a median consensus that's a pretty big outlier and that actually creates a much cleaner opportunity to trade the actual outcome when it occurs because with ADP really it, there's there's two ways to to look at ADP you get the headline figure and also it's really important that you wait for that revision to come out I can't say how important that is when you're trading ADP even though you might get a 298,000 uh, really strong number and you'll get an initial move in the market quite often what happens is you get a counter revision which normally takes anything between one to three seconds to come out and then what happens then is you get this knee-jerk spike higher in assets and then immediately pulls back and that can catch a lot of people out so just be very careful of that um, on a broader perspective though I'd say that either way if this comes out again around 300,000 or drops to 200,000 I certainly don't think this is going to change really the picture in terms of Fed thinking and even 200,000 is still fairly robust growth in jobs in the US and so really uh, outliers you're looking at extremities of plus 300 sub 200 I'd say to, to get a bit more of a, of a bigger market reaction out of the number but certainly this will set the scene for for non-farms of course which is on Friday otherwise you've got ISM non-manufacturing uh, people will be looking at that not just for the headline reading uh, which if you remember manufacturing earlier this week was a minor beat but some of the sub components were interesting the employment constituent um, earlier this week was better than previous but new orders was weaker and so it's not just about reading interpreting a main headline figure it's about the overall summation of the report particularly the employment constituent is key because again that's another piece of the puzzle for expectations and non-farms then you've got the DOE all infantry data in the afternoon and you've actually got the FOMC minutes don't forget as well they're coming out this evening at seven o'clock um, FOMC minutes will be interesting for there's one point of which might capture some interest again these are the, the minutes surrounding the meeting where obviously they hiked rates but they had a bit more of a dovish stance in terms of their summary of economic projections i.e. the trajectory of rates in the years after 2017 and beyond a key point though that you might have heard a lot of people talking about is about the Fed's balance sheet uh, and I did send this article out to you guys this morning uh, please do take a read this is about basically how well if you think about this graphic here the swollen balance sheet of the Fed so these are the you know if you I wouldn't look at the the far left I'd look at the period of the global financial crisis or the, the mortgage crisis and so from the end of 2007 2008 into 2009 this is when you have this massive spike in the Fed's balance sheet you know absolutely huge spike now this means that this is when we started going through the process of quantitative easing you know QE 1 2 and so on from the from the Fed each time the balance sheet getting proportionally larger from the Federal Reserve however it's gone sideways ever since they stopped QE and the process of tapering commenced the question mark now is about reduction of the balance sheet however reduction of the balance sheet in theoretical terms is basically a tightening of the market which will affect the yield curve which is akin to raising interest rates so you've got a decision here you're on the path of raising interest rates but you also want to reduce the debt on the Fed's balance sheet which in effect acts the same way for yields as hiking interest rates what you don't want to do is the market already gets a little bit uncomfortable when you start hiking rates if you're going to bring in the tightening of the balance sheet that's almost propelling this interest rate move even further and obviously the market could get very unsettled by that 
That's what happened, what was called the taper tantrum a few years ago. The market gets completely spooked that this accommodative period all of a sudden becomes super tight policy and the market's just not ready for it yet. Um, so an interesting article here talking about the various sequencing, uh, the various tools and timing. All of this I would suggest you, you have a bit of a read on. I'm just touching upon it from a, a top level at the moment and happy to talk about this later uh, before we finish today. One good tweet that I did see, and uh, I'll pop this graphic into the uh, the chat room when I'm done with the briefing, and that was this debate about the Fed balance sheet reduction is hotting up. Here's what you need to know. Uh, what's quite interesting here is about the Fed holdings of treasuries by year of maturity. So basically, if I go back to this one, during the QE process, what the Fed were buying was a combination of treasuries and also mortgage-backed securities. Now, when you buy a bond, obviously a bond has a maturing date. So when that date, one of the methods that the Fed could use in its timing uh, and sequencing, so to speak, is that instead of actively looking to go into the market and taper, they could effectively let the bonds mature and just not reinvest. And so that would lead to this, meaning that you could let these Fed holdings of US Treasuries gradually mature to a point where you're just holding less. And so therefore the balance sheet naturally would decrease, uh, if that makes sense. I know a lot of these concepts might be a bit foreign to some of the, the newer trainees, uh, but again, I did send out a couple of articles for you to, to have a read uh, in your morning research. So any questions, let me know. Okay, it's your morning briefing going to leave it at that we've had these final service PMIs come out remember from Europe these are the final readings hence the reason why they've had zero impact on market prices this morning so just one <coughs> final words then 930 UK service data coming up definitely be watching the pound over that release then in the afternoon don't get caught by ADP that comes out at 1.15, so it's a slightly irregular time compared to normal US data. So 1.15, 3 o'clock, 3.30 is kind of your key period in the afternoon. Uh, and remember, if there's anything to have learned in the last two days, is that the European morning has been fairly quiet. The action has really come in the afternoon. So, you know, be disciplined and approach it possibly with the same mind frame because today could well end up being the same. The only flash of interest maybe for the morning will be that UK data point. Donald Trump obviously was active on Twitter yesterday. Uh, what was the comment that he made? He talked about a very major haircut to the Dodd-Frank rule. In simple terms, I'm not talking about getting my, you know, my hair trimmed. I'm talking about toning down of regulations. And these are very important. The Dodd-Frank rule very much was the most overarching kind of or regulation to come in post-financial crisis that impeded bank activity. If banks are not active in the market, they don't generate revenue, they don't make money. Banks suffered hugely under um, very intense regulations that came in post the global financial crisis. Trump wants to do a major change. If you hear words like major watering down of these rules, essentially as you saw yesterday that's an equity positive particularly for the banking sector so individual stocks like goldman's bank of america city rally quite aggressively on that type of talk so trump although he's been a little bit more quiet and a little bit more contained more recently his tweets as they did yesterday still have the propensity to move the market so whatever you think about him be objective his comments are important uh, and if he does make any tweets or if he has any press conferences today, of course, I'll keep you updated. Okay, guys, it's nine o'clock. So I'm going to leave it at that. Enjoy your day and I'll see you in the chat room. Thank you.